My name is Christian DePay. I teach in the history department here. Uh, my field is uh, Song history, and so I'm particularly pleased uh, to have a small role in this, in this uh, conference in honor of Marty Powers, uh, who is, of course, an important colleague and a fellow uh, Song Dai uh, as they say, a Songist, uh, convinced that uh, Song history is, or the Song dynasty is the greatest period in human history. Um, but I'm also pleased because um, Marty actually taught me uh, when I was a graduate student. This was a very brief moment. I was in Taiwan doing my dissertation research uh, in 1995, 96, and Marty came by at the Shu uh Institute of History and Philology in Taiwan uh, in, in 1996. He was there for a week. I didn't know him, I hadn't met him before, uh, but we got to talk and found a lot of common ground, and he pointed out to me at the time that um, I should know about art, and I should know about art history, because uh, the, sort of the debates that I was sketching for him, political debates, literary debates, he said the same debates are going on in art history, and there's no reason you know, to ignore those, and you should know about sort of these debates about you know, clumsy uh, uh, brushwork versus uh, clever brushwork and so on. And so I did, and I learned, and, uh, and this has improved my work uh, a great deal. Today I'm here to uh, introduce uh, the next two speakers. Uh, the first one is J.P. Park, and it seems, it seems a little bit strange to introduce the organizer of the conference. Uh, but of course, it's a pleasurable task you all know him, you all know his work, you know that he's an associate professor of the history of art at the University of California at Riverside, uh, and that he has published and researched very widely on China, as well as on Korea, on late imperial times, as well as on contemporary art, uh, on local art, as well as not just global, but post-global art. Um, and that in his work, uh, at least in my interpretation, Right, he questions the nature and substance of art through what is perceived to be its other, reproduction, imitation, forgery, and so on. His first book, of course, is Art by the Book, Painting Manuals and the Leisure Life of Late Ming China. His second book is just out, A, middle, a New Middle Kingdom, Painting and Cultural Politics in Late Chosun, Korea. Um, and besides this, he has uh, contributed to a catalog, Keeping It Real, Korean Artists in the Age of Multimedia Representation. Uh, and he has a, a very important uh, manual handbook uh, forthcoming called A Companion to Korean Art History, together with uh, Professor uh, Ju Hyung Ri of uh, Seoul National University. And he's currently working on forgery, namely in a manuscript entitled Presence and Absence, Documents, Forgeries, and Myth-Making in Chinese Art. So please help me welcoming the organizer of this conference, J.P. Park. All right, thanks so much for the introduction and really happy to see my friends, my teachers, and <coughs> colleagues. So at least there's one benefit of my advisor being retired actually, so I can see everyone in one location in one day for a couple of days. So before I begin, I have a couple of announcements for the, you know, today's function <laughs> as because part of my job. So we have placed this guest book on the table, but somehow it's still empty, it's no one has written. <laughs> so instead of, you know, telling you to go to the table and, you know, leave your, you know, comments and then compliments and comments, Professor Powers, why don't I circulate this in this room right now? So every one of you can leave your name and then maybe short comments and then you know com complimentary comments and comments for him. So I'm gonna start with. <laughs> and second comment uh, uh, is announcement is that there will be a uh, sh quick uh, follow up after this panel. So if you are participants and then moderators of this conference, please stay in the room so we have to take a few group photos together. All right, so after I finished my book, uh, originally I was not planning to read my paper in this conference, not because uh, I, w I didn't want to, but because 
I have no materials to present. So I was desperately looking for a new topic, actually, which can eventually become my next book project. And earlier this year, fortunately, I think I actually stumbled, stumbled upon very important material, which I will present today. I mean, as the, this topic is still uh, uh, in the beginning stage. Is I think it's, I propose this as a work in progress. Oh, here. In the spring of 2017, Taiwanese media covered a course verdict on Jiang Bin, a former celebrity actor who had been sued for fraud and embezzlement, for, uh, embezzlement by his younger cousin. Newspapers reported how Jiang Bin acted as go-between to sell eight paintings for his cousin in 2005, but he only delivered a fraction of the price he obtained from the sale of two works, and even worse, he allegedly lost the other six paintings. He claimed innocence at court, explaining that he had been framed and swindled by a Chinese buyer. Now the whereabouts of all eight paintings supposedly created by Chinese master painters of the past, Yan Liban, Zhao Guan, Miu Ren, Lin Bu, Xia Gui, Gao Kugong, Tang Yin, and Chen Feng are no longer traceable. What I found most intriguing in this report was not the story of how Jiang Bin and his cousin ended up in this dire legal dispute but the rarity of works at issue in this litigation. Just the name values of the artists listed compels the attention of anyone interested in Chinese art. For example, Yan Liban's painting is a singular piece not only because Yan's work, original work is extremely scarce, but also because he is really associated with landscape paintings in historical record. Although the work has disappeared, it was fortunately printed in a great scale in an exhibition catalog published in Tokyo, 1928. When it was on, on loan from a renowned Chinese official and collector, Guan Mianjun, to the Tokyo National Museum. So it would be difficult to, for any art historian to prove that this is a typical seventh century, uh, century style. Of further interest is the fact that among dozens of paintings Guan loaned to the exhibition, there are other works that do not quite match our current knowledge of Chinese art history in terms of subject matter and period styles. In the catalog, we find a landscape by Huang Chen. But Huang Chen is better known for his naturalistic expression in birds and flower paintings. In addition, it is also quite problematic to square the style of this painting with other established 10th century works. The very year Guan Mianjun uh, exhibited these paintings in Tokyo, he published a list of his entire collection. Among the 185 works in the volume dating from Tang to Qing dynasties are rare paintings that had hardly been addressed in previous historical records. Interestingly, Many of the rare pieces in Guan's catalog are also registered in another older source from late Ming period. In 1633, Zhang Taizhe, a highly educated scholar official from Songjiang, published a woodblock edition of record of treasured painting, Bao Hui Lu, an extensive account of his private painting collection. Over its nearly 900 pages, the book registers 332 paintings by 90 master painters accompanied by systemat systematically transcribed colophons of individual works. This book could be a very useful source, resource for, art history, I mean, for, for historians of Chinese art as it provides a count of many paintings by artists whose works no longer existent. However, there is one major problem. This book is a forgery. The entire roster of paintings, as well as their textual records, are fabrications that Zhang Taizhe ingeniously and meticulously created. But Zhang did not stop there. He also forced paintings to match the records in the volume so he could profit from the trading in those fact works. Both Yan Liban and Huang Chen's works above are the exact matches for uh, works registered in Zhang's book. Thus, it is likely that both were created either by Zhang Taizhe or under his supervision. Other similar examples have been identified in various collections, such as the painting uh, attributed to the Tang Dynasty master Yang Sheng, which is 
now uh, currently housed at the Palace Museum in Beijing. So the colorpon attached to the painting matches exactly the you know, colorpon register in Zhang Taiji's book, uh, as you can see actually here, I, but I wasn't able to find a photo of that, you know, the colorpon, but it's actually attached on top of the painting. In sum, by means of this uh, monumental project, forging and circulating this well-documented grand collection, Zhang promoted himself as one of the most knowledgeable art collectors of the time. Over the rest of Imperial Chinese history, a few scholars did point out the spurious nature of the book. For example, Qing Dynasty scholar Wu Xiu noted in 1824, quote, it was not for permanent fame, but for making money. We laugh at this man named Zhang telling an outrageous lie. First, he circulated the catalog, then sold the forged paintings to reap a fat profit. Over the past decades, I have, been, I have seen more than a dozen of these pieces. All the colophons in the verse were written in one single hand, mostly on the light yellow paper made in Songjiang, unquote. My focus is not to highlight the artistic flaws of tricksters or credulity of public in early modern China, but to examine historical and analytical irregularities that have been institutionalized in the study of Chinese art. We must question how he was able to pull off this bold chicanery and what impact this practice might have had in the history of Chinese art. Forgeries, not as an artistic deception, but as an imaginative fiction and, and or historical aberration, ask us to rethink the conventional reading of historical narr narr narratives. To do this, we need to highlight the complicated and twisted cycle of copying and being copied in the production and consumption of, consumption of Zhang's publications. First of all, while most of the book's content was probably creatively concocted by, by Zhang Taiji himself, he also recycled from previous sources. Many passages consist of writings by Dong Chi Chang, Ku Ji Yusu, and Wang Shi Zhen that have been lifted and tailored to fit better the paintings Zhang invented. Then in a truly fascinating development, Zhang's book was over time mistakenly accepted as a legitimate source of our historical knowledge. It was also consulted and copied by a number of later forgers, and its content were dispersed in numerous later publications, some of which have even been cited by modern art historians. So what is also interesting is that this book was printed again three more times in using different wood blocks in Qing times. And in 19th century, Japanese also created their own version of this book. So altogether, before 20th century, this book was printed four more times. So altogether printed five times. So one interesting example in a, example in a painting attributed to Dong Yuan at National Palace Museum in Taipei, uh, sorry. One interesting example is the painting attributed to Dong Yuan at National Palace Museum in Taipei. The title of the painting uh, uh, the title of the painting matches one listed in Bahue Lu, but then there is an interesting difference. Bahue Lu transcribes five colophons written by Huang Tingjuan, Zhang Yi, Wu Zhen, Tang Yin, Wen Zhengmeng. The Palace Museum works has a different lineup of six colophons by Ouyang Xuan, Ni Zhan, Zhang Yi, Xue Heng, Chen Zhai, and Wang Chen. Between them, only one colophon that by Zhang Yi matches exactly the one in Bahue Lu. Another work by Ni Zhan, now housed at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, has two inscriptions added by the artist himself, and two colophons by Wu Quan and Wang Ao, along with a couple of later colophons inserted by Zhang Daqian. The artist's inscription and then two colophons by Wu and Wang match those in Bawe Lu word for word. But additional colophon by Wen Zhengmeng printed in the book somehow does not appear on the painting. The exact reason for and context of selective transcription, transcription to and from painting are still open to question. Yet what is evident in both examples is that Bahue Lu was centrally situated within the practice of forgery in early modern China. One likely reason, and trans, uh, uh, one likely reason that transcription made it onto the other forged work is the helpful fact that Bahue Lu's Textual content were reproduced in a number of later publications, including Yuan Xixuan, 
Yuding Tiwa Shilei and Nansung Wien Hao Lu and Wen Zhengmeng Wen Ji. In addition, many of the forged paintings supposedly created with Afro Bao He Lu are registered in Xu Qi Bao Ji of Qing Dynasty. So it is no secret that Qianlong Emperor actually had a number of forgery uh, in his collection, and evidently some of them actually, it's not evidently, it appears it's likely that some of them were actually made by Zhang Taijie. Thus, Bao He Lu created a reverse cycle of recording history without knowing that the original sources were copied out of Bao He Lu, modern scholarship has quoted contents of these compilations as reliable information. So even though the scholars who knows that uh, Zhang Taiji's Bao He Lu is a forgery, since its content were dispersed into many other later publications, uh, actually I found one mistake, my, even myself, I quoted one poem in Tiwa Shi Lei in my first book, it turned out that actually was copied from Zhang Taiji's Bao He Lu. So I'm not, Probably I'm not gonna actually, you know, should not actually, should not have admitted this, but you know, people actually make mistakes. So, Bao He Lu then offers a unique case in our history wherein a forgery becomes an original, <laughs> resulting in, as Umberto Eco wittily noted in Focus Pendulum, our history amounts to an effort to arrive at truth through a painstaking reconstruction of a false text. What is probably most important in the study of Bao He Lu is that we cannot simply dismiss it as a liter literary forgery of one unethical scholar official. First of all, forgeries are important historical materials. The fakes produced in any society may reflect the demand more accurately than genuine works, since they mirror the perceived, perceived desires of the market and collectors. Furthermore, forgeries are a sign of resistance. A good deal of recent scholarly literature on forgery have, has focused on its creative rather than criminal dimensions, or at least recognized conjunctions between the two. Forgery can also be a form of symbolic opposition to an existing system or hierarchy, and thus pose itself as a site of assembly wherein the history of cultural struggle consists of repeated attempts to control significant size of discourse. If we uh, approach Bao He Lu from this deconstructive mode of analysis, we could recognize that it also conforms to the other ongoing trend of late Ming period. Forgeries had, a long, had long been a part of Chinese art world, but it was not until the late, later 16th century that they inundated the market to, the, to meet the soaring demands of China's emerging middle class. For example, Dung Fu noted that the work of Zhao Mengfu was so popular, thus more than 400 painters made a living copying him in mid-16th century. Similar accounts are dispersed across dozens of writings of the time, and indeed a myriad of forged paintings are dated to late Ming, many of which remain in major collections and institutions. So I have one example here. This is actually the painting attributed to uh, Huizhong Emperor. Uh, in addition to its spurious nature of the stylistic you know, characteristic, what is really interesting is, if you actually look at that uh, colophon, the first colophon is writ supposedly written by Zhang Mengfu. It says the fourth year of Yuan Jing era, but the problem is Yuan Jing era ended in second year. <laughs> so you can definitely see that this is definite forgery. And also, if I just add another comment, I mean, the t number of titles, I mean, number of these paintings uh, created by Wang Wei, registered in Song and Yuan dynasty uh, records, are about 120. But the, the number of those Wang Wei's work registered in Ming Qing dynasties actually getting close to 300, meaning that I don't think actually Ming Qing people actually found, accidentally found 200 more paintings Wang Wei. They definitely made the Wang Yi's paintings for the market and themselves. So interestingly, it is not only the true for visual art, numerous fake books, Wei Shu, also dates from late Ming China. Just like paintings, the forged books has a long history in China, but the sheer number of such books from late Ming far exceeds any other moment in Chinese history. So this is one of the well-known book who actually studies philology in China. And surprisingly, if you actually look at uh, 
the number of titles from Lake Ming, the forged page and fake, fake books, it consists of about all close to half of their titles actually that covers the entire Chinese history. Furthermore, the terms such as fake recluse, fake calligraphic model books, fake antiques, fake money, fake measure, fake celebrity, fake alumni, fake students, fake candidates, fake names, fake qing, are more than frequently found across various writings of the period. Thus, not only visual, literary, material culture, but also in social interactions, personal identities, and even subject emotions, the word fake as a prefix came to be a cliche in Ming society. This helped us understand why late Ming was the time period when society became so obsessed with authenticity in art and literature. Evidently, the enthusiasm for authentic, real, and original was in reaction to the massive impact of fakes, forgeries, and counterfeits in the cultural and material lives of the time. In this regard, one other realm of the discourse deserves illumination in line with Zhang Taiji's book and Flood of Forgeries in Late Ming China. Right before the turn of the 17th century, Tong Chi Chang, the arbiter of artistic taste of the time, propounded this Southern and Northern School theory, which would now which would become a nearly indisputable artistic norm for the remainder of the imperial period and even up to the present. Dong's theory has been over-investigated to the point where recent art historical studies intentionally avoid any discussion of the subject. While a number of scholars try to summarize and analyze the program's influence and even inconsistencies of Dong's theory, very few have ever dug into its sociocultural motivations and rhetorical underpinnings. Just as Zhang Taiji's forgery has not been previously been considered as a peculiar yet typical product of the period, perhaps Tong Chi Chang's Southern and Northern School theory has also escaped careful historical contextualization. In fact, Tong Chi Chang was neither first nor the only critic of his, his day who proposed assessing art historical lineage to determine legitimacy and hierarchy in artistic qualities and taste. We know that a number of literary of the period, Li Kaixian, Wang Shichan, and Li Hu Liangjun, and Wang Jideng, Zhang Jinfang, Gao Lian, Xiang Yuanbian, Mo Xilong, and Wang Kuntang, Li Ruhao, Shen Hao, and Xu Qin, and there are more, also put for their own evaluations of artistic genealogy. These intellectuals expressed a range of opinions, but their goal was the same, to project and institute their personal view on art history. They each proposed that their own, uh, they each proposed their own universal law to dictate what constitutes elegant, legitimate, and authentic taste in art. From this perspective, Tong Chi Chang was not a pioneer, pioneer in our history, but simply another participant in widespread cultural practice of the time. Then what is the nexus between forged paintings produced for the market and artistic theories created by elite audience in late Ming? Far from being a primary site of radical challenges to social hierarchies, Forgery in late Ming China was a kind of cultural spectacle wherein a race among elites to promote their own art history, artistic values was sustained by the desires of social upstarts from below. Ironically, forgeries also constituted a site of symbolic opposition to elite discourse and privilege, since it also provided a means by which emerging popular and middle class society could st stimulate new desires and manifest its own artistic creativity. Thus, if you understand forgeries of late Ming as a site of conflict and negotiations in the production and consumption of art invisibly shared between different classes, values, and practices, the establishment of a refined and elegant public sphere under its distinctive notion of legitimate lineage can be understood as an attempt to buy at least to regulate public discourse on art. By this, they could create conditions favorable to their exclusive control of artistic spheres. And in this regard, Dong's theory was hardly an incidental or personal act of artistic or cultural hygiene. In these seemingly independent operations of artistic practice, 
which were regulated according to significantly different manners and norms, both forgery paintings for the market and their artistic theories of elite class in late Ming were inconspicuously yet firmly interrelated. Therefore, if Zhang Taizhi's book was a literary invention that produced fictional history, then Dong Chi Chang's theory opened a door on reconfiguration of the past, thus author historical fiction. Thank you. Thank you for uh, JP for the, the great talk about you know forgery in in the late Ming, which is always such an interesting phenomenon. Um, I'm here to announce the second speaker, Timothy Brook, um, professor of history at the University of British Columbia, uh, also past president of uh, the Association for Asian Studies in 2015, and as most of you will know. Uh, the author of a wide range of publications on a wide range of issues, late imperial and modern Chinese history, uh, and even global history. And I guess we can see in his publications over the years uh, a gradually widening scope from local gazetteers, very local, uh, to general histories of the Ming Dynasty, such as uh, Praying for Power, Buddhism and the Formation of Gentry Society in Late Ming China, The Confusions of Pleasure, and uh, the Troubled Empire uh, in a series of general histories of China, of which uh, Timothy Brook is also the editor. And then more recently, uh, histories of a global scope, um, such as Vermeer's Hat, the 17th century, and the dawn of a global world, and his current book manuscript, Tales from the Great State, China and the World, 14 times. Um, and so Timothy Brook is, uh, as you may gather from this, a particularly suitable speaker for this conference uh, for Marty because he, like Marty, has tried to give China a place in wider conversations about world history and the way we think about uh, world history. And he is also, uh, as an historian, very much interested in material uh, culture, as he will no doubt show us in his talk today. Rather than um, situate China in relation to Europe, which I've been doing a great deal about, I'm going to try and situate China in relation to Tibet and Sri Lanka today. That's the task I've set for myself. Uh, um, the, the, the presentation is going to be a bit convoluted. There are many moving parts to this story. And I have to say, I haven't done any, anything that I would call original research. I am largely working with the work of other people and trying to rearrange the way in which the parts of the story of Zheng He in Sri Lanka get told in order to try and sketch the larger picture. Zheng He is the bete noir of Ming studies. In my, earlier in my career, I vowed I would never touch him. Um, but you, know, you, you are always drawn to the sore points. And, uh, and so I've had to deal with Zheng He, alas. But what I want to do in this talk is it's, it's a way of trying to think about the nature of the Ming state. And I'll explain what that nature is going to look like in just a minute. But I'm, I want to start. Um, with, well, here, here, here's the outline of what I'm going to do today. Just a sec, let me just rearrange this screen a little bit better. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start with uh, a, a story about the Buddha's tooth uh, from Sri Lanka. Then I want to think about why the Ming state would have an interest in the tooth. We'll then move with, uh, to the Zheng He occupation of Sri Lanka. Um, and that we're going to look at the Gala Stele, which is one of the texts from the Zheng He expeditions. Finally, what really interests me are the last two points of this talk, whose story is this, and the issue of colonial monuments. So, the Buddha's tooth. In March 1413, according to a letter found in the Potala in 1959, uh, Emperor Yong Lu sent a letter to the fifth Karmapa Lama, who would at the time roughly be the second most important Lama in Tibetan Buddhism. He starts the letter on a personal note. He says, once in the still of the night, 
Um, and I think I've got the, well, I'll come back to this in a moment. Um, let me just, no, I'll, I'm, I'll, I'll do this first. Um, uh, the fifth Karmapa Lama had visited Nanjing in 1407 at the request of Emperor Yongle to hold a mass in honor of his father and mother, his father whose succession he overturned when he murdered his nephew and took the throne. Um, this is part of uh, a larger strategy of politics that I'll come back to in a, in a moment. And during this time, there was what uh, Marsha Widener in her wonderful book, Intersections of Chinese Buddhism called a moment of consensual hallucination. It's a term she takes from William Gibson uh, in his novel, um, what is it called, The Neuro, Neuromancer, I think. Um, uh, during the time that the, the mass was being performed in Nanjing, miraculous visions were seen by everyone and reported by everyone. Um, but when the emperor says something has been seen, who are you to say that you haven't seen it? And in fact, to say that you haven't seen it is directly insulting, and therefore everyone joined in the massive hallucination of 1407. Well, in 1413, we have this letter, and he says, he starts the letter by saying, once in the still of the night, we were sitting in formality when several balls of light appeared in the courtyard, like moons in an empty sky, like great bright mirrors. In the largest of these could be seen Bodhi treasure trees of many sorts. And then in the midst of one of these trees, there's an image of Shakyamuni. He's just clearly displaying his 32 trademarks, curly hair, large earlobes. And then Junglo goes on to describe other aspects of this marvelous vision um, and rounds it off by saying the appearance of Buddha, the Buddha to him um, confirms the fact that Buddhism when vibrant is the best source for an emperor who is seeking to rule. To commemorate the vision, he tells Karmapa Lama that he's commissioned sculptors to carve a, and gild a statue based on his vision and um, to send it to the fifth Karmapa. Uh, during these years, uh, Yunglu was trying to patronize a number of Tibetan sites and this, letter, this statue was going to be part of the, of the uh, work that he was doing in Tibet. Now, while all this was going on, he tells the Karmapa, at the very moment that he was having his vision, his eunuch Zheng He was in Ceylon fighting the Ceylonese. And at this point, um, we get this account. He said, fighting their way back to the, uh, Zheng He has landed. I'll tell you about the story in a minute. He's landed in, in, in Ceylon. Uh, he's been trapped. He goes on to the capital, captures the king, and then brings the king back to the coast. Fighting their way back to the coast, the emperor tells the Karmapa, Zheng He and his men reached the ships that evening, bringing the Buddha's tooth relic on board with all due ceremony. The relic emitted a bright light in a most unusual manner, and a peal of thunder rumbled so loudly that people, even at a great distance, uh, took cover. So then the, the ships embark, the tooth is on board, and the tooth goes to work there, creating such perfect sailing environment that there, there are no storms, no winds and uh, no waves, but the right winds. Uh, and the fleet sailed, quote, just as if the sailors were walking on dry land. It's a standard phrase for smooth sailing. <clears throat> Fearsome dragons and dangerous sea creatures rose up before the ships, but then turned back, causing no harm. Everyone on board was safe and happy. And the note ends by reporting that Zheng He delivered the tooth relic from Sri Lanka to Yong Le, who's ordered a sandalwood reliquary to be built for it. So, what's going on? Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the teaser, I'll, I'll just tell you, is that there is no evidence of a tooth relic anywhere in the Yong Le court or subsequently. So, what is happening? Well, this all has to do with the nature of the Ming state. And this is part of a larger argument that I started making two years ago and will be making in print again next year. And that is the concept of the great state. The Mongol occupation of China in the 13th century transforms the nature of how the state is imagined, what the state is understood to be capable of, and what the ruler of such a state is understood to be capable of. Uh, the term has mixed Chinese-Mongol origins, ik ulus in, in Mongol. It's a something like an empire, but I prefer to use 
a translation of an indigenous Asian term rather than the term of empire, which is so loaded with other kinds of connotations. I really don't want to go near it. But the, the, the thing about a great state is that it is infinitely expandable, and the ruler of the great state is in a position to legitimately absorb territories of all other rulers and to force all other rulers to submit to him. Emperor Yunglo came to the throne in 1402 by overthrowing, overthrowing his nephew, committing, uh, committing nepoticide. Uh, uh, probably none of you have heard that there is a term for killing your nephew, and that's what uh, Yunglo did. Um, Yunglo then faces a massive legitimacy deficit within Chinese terms because uh, the succession had been laid out by his father that it should go through the, the eldest son to the grandson and not go out to the side to a brother. Uh, so this creates a crisis for Chinese. There's not a single Chinese alive in 1402 who thinks this man is legitimate, but as you usually do when power is overwhelming, you suck it up and, and you become a loyal servant of that new emperor. But it also, uh, it made sense, however, to non-Chinese because the model of the great state is that it should be ruled by the most powerful ruler, and if the most powerful ruler is some a uh, wimpy 20-year-old who's interested in Confucian teachings, then get him out of the way and get a more competent ruler in place. So Yung Lu was committing what, what my professor uh, from my graduate student days, Joe Fletcher, called uh, bloody tanistry. You simply remove the relatives who stand in the way of your becoming the next ruler. And so it's a, a standard act of bloody tanistry to kill your nephew. Um, however, it does create a bit of an embarrassment at home, and it creates a problem abroad because you... Yong Lu, as a great state ruler, then has to construct a, a, uh, a sense that he is the legitimate ruler. One way to do it, and the what Kublai Khan and others would do, was simply get on your horse and start conquering. But Yong Lu is taking a different tack here. He does get on his horse. He does lead campaigns against the Mongols. They are not terrifically successful. But instead, he sends the message out to the world by sea rather than by ship. Kublai Khan also did that, and we're going to come back to Kublai at the end of this talk. So um, he has to send out envoys. He does not send out Chinese officials. He sends out eunuchs, and he sends them abroad in order to um, encourage state rulers around the world to recognize him as the next legitimate ruler of the Ming great state. And the Da Ming, it's a the Da Yuan Da Ming Da Qing. I think that I take that Da to be a highly specific. Um, uh, uh, designation for a particular state form. So it's not the great Ming, it's the Ming great state. Well, he was also doing this in Tibet, and he's in, this is why the fifth Karmapa comes to Nanjing. It's part of his strategy to try and use the spiritual resources of Tibetan Buddhism against Mongol uh, competitors with his own rule. And also it's to, to establish a kind of um, build up the flood of ambassadors who are going to come to Nanjing to recognize him as the new ruler. Um, that's why um, Zheng He is sent off to, uh, uh, to Southeast Asia and to the Indian Ocean. It is to, um, to construct a, if you like, a consensual hallucination among the rulers of South Asia and Southeast Asia, that Yung Le is the legitimate and correct ruler. So you all know the, the Zheng He story. I will speed along here. I've put the gems in because uh, uh, Yung Le was particularly keen on gems. Gems are constellations of heavenly power buried in the earth. The more he could get, the more it indicated that he had heaven's mandate to rule. And there's a particular proliferation of these gems in um, mid-15th century tombs. He's giving these gems out to his relatives, and they ended up in their tombs, and we're now digging them up. And uh, uh, this is all part of the fantasy of, of South Asian uh, dominance. The incident that, that gets tangled up with this letter to the Fifth Karmapa is the Battle of Ceylon, or what's, what's been called the Battle of Ceylon. And on this, this is a, um, the, uh, the uh, copy of a copy of a copy of a map that might have something to do with Zheng He's travels that's preserved in the early 17th century. And it shows South, South Asia and the, the island of Ceylon. Um, the right-hand side of the map is, the top is oriented north. The left-hand side of the map, the top is oriented to the left. So you have to sort of make that adjustment. But the representation of Ceylon is not bad. And uh, we can identify most of the important sites on Ceylon when, when Zheng He was there. 
Zhonghe first sails, uh, comes into the coastal waters of Ceylon in 1406. Uh, he uh, approaches from the east, goes around to the west, uh, lands at what is now Colombo, at the time called Cote, which is the fort of the Viceroy. Um, in all due ceremony, uh, seeks to uh, represent his emperor to the king of Ceylon, and he's abruptly uh, kicked out by Nisanka Alagakonara, who is the viceroy and the man in charge of the military protection of the kingdom. So the uh, Zheng He and his people have to get back on their ships. They leave, they go off to India, they come back um, and decide to just bypass the island of Ceylon altogether. They come back in, in 1408. This becomes a kind of, it's a commuter operation. This is not one great uh, voyage after another. You've got to get the ambassadors to Nanjing. Then you've got to ship them all back again, pick up a new set of ambassadors. So 1408, he comes back and he gives uh, Ceylon a complete miss, doesn't even land. This is seen by the Ceylonese as proof that uh, what Nisanka Alagakonara did as viceroy was the correct thing to do. You've, he's told the Chinese, you are not allowed to land here. And so they're obeying. Third time, 1410, they come through again, and this time they try and land again. Uh, this does not go well. Nisanka Alagakonara um, musters. Uh, Zheng He on this voyage has close to 30,000 men. Uh, Nisanka Alagakonara, by estimate, has 50,000 men. Uh, there's a military standoff, Zheng He has to leave again. But um, to be insulted a second time on behalf of your emperor is something that Zheng He can't deal with. So he has to, when he comes back in February of 1411 on his return voyage, he lands his army. Um, he, uh, he, he says he's seduced into, into the interior by Alagakonara. He's cut off from the coast. Um, most of his soldiers, well, a part of his, the body of his soldiers are with him. He has to send some of them back to the coast because as soon as he leaves the coast, the ships are then under attack from Nisanka Alagakonara, who's just going to strip them of, of everything they've got. Um, he's going to take everything in the fleets and kill all the Chinese. Um, Zheng He, he anticipated that Zheng He would, would try and fight his way back to the coast and would be ambushed. But in fact, Zheng He decides to go on to the capital, which is Gampolo in the, excuse me, in the middle of the island. He captures the king, Vera Alaga Konara, takes him back. And at that point, according to Yong Lo's letter, he also seizes the, the Buddha's tooth. This is the most sacred relic of the Buddha in the Buddhist world. And I've got photographs of it later. I'll, I'll show it to you. It's still there today. So he, he takes the king, gets him on board the ship, and they sail back, and the king is brought to the Yungla court and humiliated and deposed. I'll come back to the story. The one piece of evidence that the Chinese were there is known as the Gala Stele, which is found in the, in, was found in the port of Gala in the southwestern uh, corner of the island. It's now in Colombo in the National Museum. It was found by an English engineer by the name of Henry Tomlin. Uh, Tomlin had been in Sri Lanka by this, I'm sorry, I, I moved between Sri Lanka and Ceylon uh, without meaning anything. Uh, he'd been in Sri Lanka for about 15 years as an architect and an engineer. Um, he found this stone, and like many a good colonial officer, he's interested in the lost traditions of the place that the British Empire has conquered. And he sees this as a document of a lost tradition that he, as a colonial official, will preserve, and so he does so. Um, you're probably all familiar with the stele. It's in three languages. There's the Chinese language uh, on the right. On the left, the top half is Tamil, and uh, the lower left is um, Persian, but written in an Arabic script. The Persian has largely been um, erased, but the, the name of Allah does appear at one point, and so we have a good idea that um, this is a Muslim text. So we've got a text. The, Chinese text honors the Buddha. The Tamil text offers a, um, uh, an emanation of Vishu, Vishnu, and the Muslim text offers, uh, honors Allah. So this is, the, this is the great discovery that Tomlin has made. All right. Whose story is this? It's usually told from the, the, the Chinese sources, and the Chinese sources are miserably thin on this. 
And it makes sense that they're miserably, miserably thin because this was not a government operation. This was an imperial household operation being run by Yong Le, and we don't have the documents of the imperial household. They have never survived. So we, we work on the basis of, of, of rather thin uh, Chinese documentation. But if you go and look at the, the, the Sri Lankan documentation isn't much better. But if you try and read the sources from Ceylon, you not surprisingly get a very different picture. Um, the man who is responsible for uh, doing the early work on this is a uh, scholar named Edward Pereira. He's publishing in the first decade of the 20th century. He's, a, he's an indigenous Sri Lankan scholar. He has a, a, a Portuguese name, as, as many took. And he's reconstructed the whole history. And there's, there's some fascinating things that come out. One is that there are two Alagakonaras. Uh, Alagakonara appears in the Chinese text as, what, what is it? I've, I'm sorry, I've forgotten what the Chinese uh, pronunciation of, or the, ch the Chinese transliteration of Alagakonara is. It turns out that both the king and the viceroy have the same name. So the Chinese texts get quite confused over who's doing what when. The Alagakonara that is first named in Chinese text is the viceroy, who is the military commander. The next Alagakonara is Vira Alagakonara, who is the king of Ceylon, who is in fact seized and brought back to China. The Chinese sources say that he is humiliated. Uh, Yung Le asks his court, what do I do with this man? They all set off with his head. I'm using a, the wrong metaphor here. Um, and uh, he says he will show the magnanimity, he will spare the king, but he deposes him. And among the family members that were also seized as hostages, he chooses the one that he thinks is going to be a reasonable successor and going to respect Ming interests in the region and sends him back. Celanese tell a very different story. Oh, and then that, that prince goes back, becomes the king, and submits tribute dutifully for the next 40 years. The Celanese have a different story. According to their story, Nisanka Alagakonara, the viceroy, enabled Zheng He to seize Vera Alagakonara because he wanted to take the throne. Fine with him that Zheng He carries off the king. Nisanka Alagakonara takes his time um, and then gradually is able to um, massage the politics in order to have himself enthroned as a prince, as the king. It turns out, though, that the king has one or possibly two uh, young teenage princes that were sent into hiding when Zheng He arrives. One of these is brought out and there's a very dramatic story in which he, as uh, Nisanka Alagakonar is about to be installed as king, one of the princes steps forward with a sword, uh, literally chops off his head, and then the young prince then becomes the rightful king of Ceylon. There's another version of the story that doesn't have this dramatic moment. Uh, but uh, Nisanka Alagakonara dies and then the kid's been kept sort of in hiding by the chief priest, is brought forward to, to become the next king. So the Chinese sources think that the king of Ceylon is actually the son of Vera Alagakonara who was sent back to be a puppet. The Ceylonese sources says not at all. As soon as he got back, he's executed. And the real king um, is already on the throne and then rules for the next 40 years and cleverly sends regular tribute missions to China, just to keep the Chinese happy. So, um, so whose story is this? This, is, this becomes a problem. The real problem, though, is sorting out the Buddha's tooth. Because what the new king does is, in fact, build a new reliquary, a new temple for the tooth um, outside Gampola, um, which is there today. If you go to Kandy, you can see the Buddha's tooth. Um, the Buddha's tooth is not a particularly attractive object, but there it is on the left. Um, and there's been a series of reliquaries that have been built for it. Uh, this reliquary built by Burmese Buddhists. Uh, the other two reliquaries, I don't know where they come from, but if you want to become a patron of the Buddha's tooth, you present a reliquary. It's very important in, in, in Ceylonese foreign relations. So uh, what's going on between Emperor Yung Le and the fifth Karmapa Lama? Whose story is this? Yung Le is telling it his way. We have no source for this text other than uh, these notes. I'm sorry, I've misspelled Xuanzang, haven't I? Oh, well. Um, uh, there is a note in the Jiaxing Tripitaka uh, of the 17th century, a note to Xuanzang's account of his travels to South, South Asia. 
Um, the coverage there of Ceylon is very poor, and so the editor writes in this long note about Zheng He going to Ceylon just to sort of bring you up to date on, on Ceylonese history and the history of the Buddha and so forth. The only source for this text is the novel that was published uh, in the Wanli period, uh, a, a, a fantastical tale of how Zheng He goes off and all these battles he has and demons and Buddhas and all that sort of stuff. So the letter that Yong Lu writes appears to be based on a footnote in the Tripitaka that appears to be based on a novel that appears to be based on nothing whatsoever. Well, uh, it turns out that um, many documents that were so-called found in the Patala uh, dating from the 18th century have turned out to be forgeries. Uh, why the fifth Karmapa's letter would be in the Potala is another question entirely, but it seems that um, a series of documents were planted in the Potala to try and rewrite the history of Tibet-China relations. We have no idea, this is just, a, it's an, inkl a, an inkling that a Tibetan scholar has given me of the problem with 18th century texts in the Potala, that there are many forgeries there. I'm not even going to speculate why this letter would have been forged and put in those documents. I can leave it to you. The whole Buddha's tooth thing, though, we know is built on another story. And it's a story that Marco Polo preserves, and that's the story of Kublai Khan's attempts to secure the tooth relic in Sri Lanka. Uh, Kublai sends three high envoys in 1281 uh, to ask that the, tooth, the Buddha's tooth be given to him. And it's, it's the same story. Kublai is the, is the, is the uh, founder of the Yuan Great State. Uh, he, too, is seeking kind of heaven's legitimacy on a universal scale. The tooth is a key relic. He needs it, and he wants it. At that point, the, 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 king, of, uh, the king who is in control of the tooth relic decides, hmm, I better not say no to this guy. So he sends him two teeth instead two are better than one, hides the real tooth, of course, and gives him fakes, um, sends those back. Uh, and Kublai seems to, from what we, can, what we can tell, Kublai seems to sense that there's a problem here, so he stages a huge reception for these teeth when they arrive in Beijing. Because if they're not the real ones, he can at least induce a kind of consensual hallucination and convince Chinese that he is in now in, in possession of the tooth relic. These relics have long since been lost because it's pretty clear that they're all fakes. So I'm now going to step back from this particular story and reflect on what I'm calling colonial monuments. The Gala Stele. Um, it's, it, in a longer version of this talk, I have much more to say about the Gala Stele, but what is it doing there? It's a text, well, one, one um, Sri Lankan uh, uh, scholar has generously said, well, it's typical of the Chinese that they're able to embrace multiple faiths. Um, the odd thing, though, is that each of these texts is giving the same set of gifts. Zheng has arrived with a set of gifts. That set is being given to the Buddha, it's also being given to Vishnu, and it's also being given to either Allah or a, a, a saint, a, a Muslim saint. Can you give the same set of gifts three times? Well, I don't think so. Um, instead, you've got a kind of one-size-fits-all stele here. So if you're, if you're Sri Lankan and you're looking at the stele, you'll read the Tamil text and says, right, Vishnu. Uh, Jung Hello is our man. If you're a Buddhist, you say, ah, the Buddhist text. I, he's a supporter of the Buddhism. Buddhism. And if you're a Persian merchant who's trading in Sri Lanka, you will, you will then read the Arabic text of the Persian and realize that Jung Lo is praising the Buddha. So, uh, excuse me, uh, praising Allah. So everybody's happy. And it puts me in mind of the other set of steles that were being erected in the Indian Ocean during the same period by the Portuguese. Now, I'm not saying that uh, the one is an invitation of the other, but it's several key sites starting from the Congo going all the way into the Indian Ocean and to Southeast Asia. The Portuguese are putting up these padraos. This is one that was put up near uh, Jakarta in 1522. The stone marker marks the arrival of the Portuguese state in the region and its political, the political arrangements that are made on behalf of the Portuguese state. And there are several of these around 
uh, around South and East Asia as there were of Chinese steelies. So China and Portugal are coming from opposite ends of Eurasia and staking some kind of claim. And the stake is not made out of wood. The stake is, is made, made out of stone. But the Gala Steely is also a, a con colonial monument in another way, found by an English civil engineer, um, installed in a museum setting. Um, I, I've put, uh, Tomlin was also an architect. Uh, he himself is a fascinating character. He did the decorations on the Gala Face Hotel when he first got there. He later designs the Sri Lankan uh, exhibit at the Chicago World's Ex Exposition, which is a, a, another wonderful story. So for him, the discovery of the Gala Steely becomes a colonial monument for the British system. The government of Sri Lanka has also found it very use, uh, useful to install the Gala Steely in uh, the National Museum in order to celebrate the happy and harmonious relations between China and Sri Lanka. And it's been particularly useful for Mahinda Rajapaksa, who during the course of his presidency this decade um, has driven Sri Lanka into such an extraordinary level of debt with China um, uh, from which he has personally benefited that, that Sri Lanka now has an annual revenue of $15 billion and a debt payment of $12.3 billion. So the Sri Lankan government is on the verge of collapse. Uh, China just last January forgave a billion dollars of the debt and will probably continue to do so because Sri Lanka is turning out to be a very, it's turning out to be exactly what Zhang He hoped it would be, a kind of toehold for uh, Chinese naval presence in South Asia. So it be, it's now become an, another sort of colonial monument. Zhang He statues become another kind of colonial monument um, put up by Chinese communities and pro, by pro-Chinese business interests throughout um, Southeast Asia, these are from Malaysia, Sarawak, uh, Singapore, uh, and Indonesia. Um, uh, I find them all quite hilarious, but I'm a historian, I'm not, an icon uh, I I'm not a myth maker. Um, perhaps the most curious one of all, though, is this one of Zheng He and his father from, from Quenyang in, in Yunnan. Curious because Zheng He becomes a slave of the emperor because his father is killed trying to keep Ming forces out of Yunnan. Um, the, official, the official notice for this statue says that Zheng He's father was an official of the Yuan dynasty, uh, ish. Um, he was actually uh, a, a, a subject, uh, he was a, uh, an officer of the Yuan great state um, who came from a family from, from Central Asia. Um, uh, uh, he's known as Mahaji because he's, uh, he's a Haji. Uh, Zheng He's father and grandfather both made the, made the Hajj to Mecca, and they saw the incoming Ming state as a disaster. He's killed uh, a Maha. The kid is 10 years old at the time, and what do you do with captive boys? You castrate them, and you distribute them around the imperial harem. And um, Maha be later becomes Zheng He makes his way up the, uh, the, the slave hierarchy in Ming China very effectively and then becomes uh, the so-called admiral. The last colonial monument that didn't happen was the Buddha's tooth. And it would have been so nice, actually, if he had stolen the Buddha's tooth, then that tooth had been installed in Nanjing and the fifth Karmapa would have had to come again, or even better, send the tooth on a, on a pilgrimage through the Tibetan regions as part of Yunglu's strategy to try and bring the Mongol world uh, to, uh, to, uh, to heal. But in the end, he didn't really need the Buddha's tooth. The letter made complete sense, and th this is the thing about a forgery, and, and JD has just showed, showed us how this works that forgeries work because there is a demand for the forgery. It fits expectations. So this forged letter was a, was a perfect case of the, uh, the state's uh, consensual hallucination extending into areas where uh, reality has long since disappeared. But that doesn't matter because the state doesn't require reality. It requires uh, collusion in reality. And that's what Emperor Yung Lu was able to achieve. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, I have a 
Fisher Park. Yes. Uh, I think you sort of frame the uh, Zhang Taiji as a uh, creator of the archival records of the paintings together with the uh, creator of the physical paintings. Mm -hmm. um, but based on, I'm thinking maybe this role as a creator was actually more subtle. Based on your, your, your um, the slice of uh, Peng Lai Fei Xue Tu, the flying snow at the mountain, that was attributed to 8th century painting. Mm -hmm. uh, Zhang Taiji cited Ke Jiu Si's account on this painting. So he is actually filling a vacancy of what we can see between what we can, we, what we can see and what we can actually see. So his role as a creator is not, not, is not creating, is not uh, actualizing his illusionary an illusionary history, but a gap filler of, of, of uh, like, as a historic, like a reader, or I don't know how to frame. So it's not something illusionary, it's something very historical. So I'm wondering if you have come up with any, any idea of that describe this vacancy feeling in the main text that you cited. Just so, I'm very ignorant of this topic, so. Uh, actually, that's a good question, but uh, one of the reasons actually I'm titled my current project is Presence in Absence, because there are so many painters actually who are registering documents and histories, but none of those works actually are existent these days. So probably, probably the situation was quite similar to, you know, even late Ming Dynasty, because uh, Dong Chi Chang also mentioned that not even a single piece of Wu Daozhi's painting survived in late Ming. But somehow we still talk about Wu Daozhi, like even 21st century. So I think that the very absence of those works somehow created the opportunities for the make the work in present, actually, you know, for these forgers to create their own version, their own understanding about these works of the past. So Yang Sheng's case definitely, it actually fit actually with other paintings attributed Yang Sheng's painting from 8th century. So, but there's no confirmed works of him. And uh, also what Zhang Taijie was, he followed the manner known during his time. He created the painting and he inserted this Kujiu's, Kujiu's colophon he himself concocted. And, but when it comes to other paintings, he made a, many other mistakes, meaning that uh, the, somehow the style does not match you know, of the style we are actually known among our historians. So, you know, Huang Chen's painting is definitely one of them. And we do not actually know what Huang Chen's landscape painting actually looked like, but he actually created based upon his imagination probably. And also Yan Liban's landscape painting. I don't think actually I didn't know that Yan Liban actually created landscape paintings until I actually saw the work attributed to him. But and then if I, I, and then I checked the uh, historical document, he did indeed actually create some landscape paintings at the time. So it's not completely a uh, forgery, but he definitely is aware of you know, uh, certain styles and the certain artistic uh, knowledge. He definitely has very uh, solid artistic knowledge. And then based upon that, he came up with his own version of creating, you know, filling the lacuna and vacuum where I, the actual work does not, did not exist any longer. Well, can we understand it's like an extension of the history? Excuse me? At like, like an extension of the history. It's, so I don't, another dimension of the past that. I, I mean, I don't think it's extension. I think that's the reason I actually use the fictionalized history because of fictive history because what he did was uh, he created the, what he, the, the book is actually a historical document, but the entire book is again, is fiction. But based upon the fiction, later our historians are trying to understand the past. I mean, you see the kind of irony there. That it's a, so historians are trying to you know, reconstruct history based upon 16th century novel. I mean, it's not gonna work. So, but somehow without knowing that document is a fiction, it was dispersed into many other books and then that was actually quoted for late, I mean, later uh, you know, scholars, etc. cetera. It, definitely created very interesting irregularity, irregular, <laughs> some sort of abnormality in, in, in historical, uh, his, historical understanding. 
So that's actually, I'm trying to track down how things got complicated because there was this one book. It's not only about the later writings, it's also about the later paintings. And it's also about even our, our current scholarship. Uh, Lota, Thank you. please. Um, there is this um, rumor going around in museum circles, I've heard it mentioned many times, that good forgers in China always give you some hint uh, that there's, uh, and if you are smart enough, you will figure them out. Uh, might this uh, mistaken year date uh, under the Ruizon scroll be an example of that? Mm -hmm. I mean, that just sounds too stupid to uh, be made by accident. Um, maybe this, this sort of gives it away um, that uh, they wanted to be caught. Just like, um, uh, I mean, on, on forged violins, you know, they use uh, in, the, uh, in the signature, they don't use the perfect tense, but they use the imperfect tense. And if you know, you know, Stradivarius faciebat, well, that's not a genuine Stradivarius. It would have to be fake it. Anyway, just this question. Oh, you want me to answer that? And, uh, you, what's your hunch on this? I mean, you know, I mean, when it comes to Zhang Taiji's book, I mean, if he had paid more attention, I can see that he could have done better work. But every single category is actually entries. There's a painting, and then there's the name of the artist, and the same lineups of these same people over and over again. So there's a Ku Jusu, and Wang Meng, and then Zhao Meng Fu, and then ends with Wang Zheng Ming. Like all these four main characters actually literally appear every single major works. And then, Whenever Wen Zhengmei actually writes down his color font for individual works, he always says, oh, this is an uh, authentic piece. Again and again, again, do not argue his uh, question is authenticity. So it's definitely is too much of coincidence. So the same pattern over and over again, if, but if Zhang Taiji said what definitely wanted to make it more believable, he could have done better work. But I'm not sure whether that was actually his intention though. Um, if I might just step in on, on uh, if I might just step in here, I, I've done some work on Li Erhua and some of the other late Ming people mm -hmm. who are doing this kind of forgery detection. They have such a wonderful time. They really enjoy finding forgeries. So I think there is a game being played. Mm -hmm. And if the if the forger is winking to the uh, to the collector, then uh, he's winking to the smart collector. The dumb collector he's, he can't see the wink, and they turn over the money. So, um, and in the end, everybody's happy, almost, mm -hmm. except <laughs> JP. <laughs> yeah, tomorrow. I'll just speak loudly. Uh, doesn't, doesn't Chi Chang sometimes say that uh, he doesn't mind the forgeries be because the forgeries actually increase his reputation. At some mm -hmm. level, he allows it to go on because that PR is essentially useful to him. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's almost like there's a game, gaming the market happening from so many different angles. I'm wondering your thoughts about the painters and how they felt about that. Yeah, definitely Dong Chichang is very ambivalent when it comes to the issue of forgery and then authentic works. And I think he also actually came across a lot of documents Interestingly, Dong Ji Chang actually actively participated, participated in trading of these forgery works. So he said there's one you know, in the diary saying that he actually purchased this forgery, but he just, next day, just sold it at market with a very fat margin. And then he makes, you know, he makes mockery of those people who actually credulously purchased those works. So It's not only Dong Chi Chang, there are many others. Zhang Jingfeng is notorious. He made a fortune making like hundreds of these forgery paintings. And he was actually, I've also found this document, he is actually proudly you know, bragging about how much money he actually accumulated for within such a short time by selling these forgeries he created and the forgeries he traded. So I think there are different tiers of communication or community at the time because that this Zhang Jingfeng and Dong Chi Chang, they are definitely predators of the market, and then there are the arbiters, they control the high-end market, and then when it comes to the actual market in a popular level, is they actually traded completely different products. And if you actually look at about, if you think about the 
southern and northern you know, school theory, there's very serious inconsistency there. It, I actually read many other you know, uh, writings he actually created. At one point, he actually uh, categorized, for example, like Lee Chung as southern school, and on the next page, he's, all of a sudden, he's deleted in the list. And he's very ambivalent of Guo Xi, too, because at one point, Guo Xi was categorized northern school painter, and then some other uh, text, he was sort of sudden, was he is kind of sided with the southern school. So, so the way I envision this project is the market as one, the forgeries as a widespread product, I mean, in a uh, practice at the time. And then when it comes to top echelon, all these elite class, they came up with their some sort of I mean, historical fiction or fictionalized history, which is, I understand as Southern Northern School theory is definitely one of them because it does not actually uh, explain everything in logic. Maybe one more question. Yeah, Lydia, go ahead. questions about um, uh, what is the authentic and the, the issue here is, uh, is there's almost a met metaphysical uh, problem here. It seems the fake produces the authentic, I mean demands uh, for the authentic is by the fr proliferation of the fake that you establish the value of the authentic. I wonder if you could you know, it re reflects uh, 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 more on that. That is uh, exactly how do we locate the value, now, not just the market. In the case of Tim's uh, presentation, you can have a tooth, right? You don't have to manufacture a tooth. You could just, uh, you know, uh, circulate something, an object. That would then also acquire value through the value of the text um, and, and political authority. So it seems that a lot is at stake, politics as well as the market. And in JP's, uh, one of your slides, you, you, um, uh, that you in indicate fake this and fake that, in, uh, including one fake celebrity. I thought the 17th century, end of the 17th century, uh, was a global year of, uh, of uh, a, a uh, uh, fakes and imposters. The most famous one, I thought, was George uh, Samnasa, from uh, you know, whom who made his name for uh, imposing for 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 um, being the most famous imposter. He says he was from Taiwan, uh, and so that uh, I mean, some of you know about this. I thought that was the. The, the, the first imposter of this kind, of this nature, but it turns out there, there were fake celebrities in the Ming. Can you elaborate that on that? Okay, I mean, I don't think I can elaborate that, you know, uh, the, I mean, uh, elaborate the question with actual fact, but I think I can uh, answer the question with uh, the manner how I approach this. So for example, it doesn't matter whether a certain object is real or not, Actually, what matters more is that whether people believe it as real or not. So, I mean, I probably might be able to take longer than you know I want to, but if I quote the you know Long Long Bart, actually people go to wrestling game and people get excited. <laughs> Why? Because do they actually believe that the, these wrestlers really passionate? No, people get excited not by passion itself, but the signs of passions these wrestlers are showing. So. As long as actually people believe those texts were real and then they was used as such, I think that's actually what how history actually evolved in later time period. And then it's history's job definitely to define whether that is fact or not, but you know, when it comes to how history operated, our job is also see why people actually believe, believe that as a uh, you know, you know, authentic or real, and then how that actually evolved in later time period. So I'm not sure whether that answers your question, but. Well, I, I was asking a different question. Um, okay. it, it was about the determination of value, because even if you rely on people's beliefs, still um, those beliefs are based on a uh, understanding of a system of value, whereby you can even call something a fake. You see what I mean? And then through that same system, you produce something as, you, you introduce this distinction between the fake and the true. And, and that distinction itself interests me. I think you can. Yeah. Yeah. Tim, do you well, want to have the last word before yes, we um, move into lunch? Um, 
I agree with the direction that you're, you're trying to go with this. There is a kind of metaphysics that's, that operates in the question of uh, what is real and what is fake. It only works when there's some high stake. That is, if you were to start, uh, I don't know, uh, faking Starbucks. I mean, there's not much to faking a Starbucks cup of coffee because the real one only costs $2. Um, if you're faking a Rembrandt, then you know, the stakes are very high. The stakes are high financially in the, for the buyer's market. The stakes are also high for the people who are in the position of arbiters, that is, cura curators, um, art dealers, art historians, of whom there are some in the room. Um, we then get implicated in the, um, in the uh, claims that are being made about, about truth and falsity. I think this also, and why I think our two papers actually sit beside each other rather nicely, is that in my case, there's no money involved. It's simply political power, and political power does the same thing. Um, it requires, um, uh, it requires the belief, well, uh, I can only, I only need to instance the comments made about Trump's inauguration to realize that what was being asked there was a kind of consensual hallucination that what the photograph shows does not capture what the reality was, which is that more people showed up for Trump than showed up for Obama. This is something that political power, particularly political power that's anxious about its legitimacy, is always going to do. People are always going to be made to celebrate what they didn't want. Um, and because without that, the state could not exist. How's that for an, an upbeat ending? <laughs> Thank you.